Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Coach's Couch. It is unbelievably hot. It is so hot. I can feel my shirt sticking to me. This is carbonated apple juice, fresh from our soda stream. It is 100% not Red Racer um, pills. That's right. Ho totally not. Totally not. So, to, so today's topic? Hunting. Yes, the hunt, the cycle of life, and how it relates to historical fencing. Which I'm sure most of you go, oh, how does it relate to historical fencing? You'd be surprised, to be honest. So his, even going back in history, you see people like knights, you see like people, because cross-cultural significance to hunting through warrior cultures. Mm -hmm. And it still persists today, but it was, in throughout period, it was a pretty common thing to see a knight with his men at arms out on the hunt. Back then, it was a necessity of life. Here, it's more of a recreational activity, but the enjoyment factor is still there. That was enjoyed back then. Some places, a necessity for life. You have to understand, a lot of these nobles were quite wealthy. Yes. And so, for them, it was also recreation. And in some aspects, some people consider it training for war. In a lot of ways. It teaches you tactics. teaches you teamwork. Understanding quarry. Yeah. Understanding ground. These are all important concepts in warfare and in combat. Exactly. And so... Without further ado, let's get to our first topic, and that's why we do it. Why, why we hunt. Why do we hunt? Well, for me, the, at first, the primary purpose was the ability to get into nature, away from cities. Cities can be really stifling. They can kind of absorb you into this pit of gray concrete and roads and smog. It's really, really releasing and refreshing to get out into the forest, around nature, around the natural world. And for those of you who don't who live in British Columbia, we do live in probably the most beautiful place on Earth, particularly here in Vancouver Island. So when you're out, when you're out in this, especially in this province, you have vast, you have vast space. You have like soaring mountain peaks and deep, lush green mountain valleys. It is absolutely a stunning place to explore. I have taken numerous panoramic shots with my very, very nice cell phone camera on these trips, and I have them saved, and they are all amazing memories that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. It also gives you an ability to reflect on your time in your life. Like, it's a time to sit and reflect. A few times better is sitting by the campfire with your friends, having a few beers after a hunt or an unsuccessful hunt, and just watching the stars on a remote lake that well, not many people see. And if it's one thing nature can do, it can always surprise you with different experiences, different things that happen. Even if you go to the same campsite you were at the year before, you will have a different experience. Also, it gets us away from our phones. And this, I mean, this is a big thing. We are, we are people constantly on our phone, whether it's on Facebook, looking to see if someone liked our post, or like on YouTube, looking, responding to comments, mm -hmm. or on some other social media platform, like kind of wondering what someone's opinion of us is. I once had a friend who referred to his phone as a leash, and I can tell you it's a very apt description of a cell phone. So it's nice to get away from that. Oh, it is a leash. It's a leash for everyday life. So this gets us away from technology and back to basics. And I'll be honest, four days out in the forest does wonders for your mental health. And if not four days, maybe even a weekend. You'd be surprised how much benefit you can glean just from a day or two out in nature away from every form of technology you have. Well, almost every form of technology. The other thing, too, is the people you go out with, you start gaining a, a deeper bond, a deeper sense of trust. Mm -hmm. Because lots can go wrong in the bush, like lots of things can go wrong in the bush. And where we go, we aren't exactly near any towns, we're like nowhere close to town. Nowhere near any first responder, really, of any kind. And sometimes we go, like, days once we went a week without seeing anyone else. Yeah, it was really nice, actually. It was actually really nice, yeah. So, on our next topic, there is a historical significance about taking someone or going on a hunt. And a lot of that you see in historical European texts, knights, lords, kings. You even see it like into the modern day British fox hunt, where you do see this upper class going out and hunting. It's not, for, it's not because they need it or normally because they need it, because these people are wealthy, they have people who run farms for them, and they definitely get the lion's share of what's produced. I mean, when you're the purveyor of violence in your local area, you do get what's yours. <laughs> and I mean, it's, uh, a lot of it was a rite of passage as well for the youth to basically transfer into adulthood, require for you to go on a hunt in order to learn what it means to take a life. I mean, it goes... Uh, 
probably goes even way much, much further back than the time period we cover in historical martial arts. I mean, going back into Celtic and even Roman times, Greek times, and beyond. And it's cross-cultural. You see it in um, Turkic cultures. You see it in First Nations cultures. You in see it in Norse culture. Norse culture. All the time. Yeah. yeah, like lots of talk of hunt. And what you do see in, in the, what comes into the modern perspective is this bonding. This talk of bonding between people who are fight who are fighting people to, who are fighting together. And it's especially prevalent in European communities because it was in fact a community. You would a lot of times go on a hunt in order to feed the people of the village you were a part of. A lot of the times there was a hunter of the village whose responsibility it was to get meat for the village in order for survival purposes. And that might be illicit too. You can't always hunt on the king's land and eat the king's animals. I mean, there's lots of interesting rebellious stories that go along with it, but that's for a different time. So it, there is elements of training to the hunt, like stalking your quarry, knowing your quarry, knowing the land. These are all very important elements that teach you not only patience, but, te but they also teach you the ability to memorize and learn what, you, what your, essentially your opponent exactly. is doing. I mean, let's face it, hunting is not easy. It is a very difficult task. It requires a lot of concentration, a lot of discipline. It's not like going to a grocery store in the meat aisle and picking something up out of a freezer. It definitely is not. There's a lot of preparation involved as well. When you go to take the shot on your animal, you want to make sure you hit what you aim at. So you have to practice ahead of time. If you don't prepare for a hunt, it's not going to be a very successful one. Well, yeah, that's a big thing too. It's like making that ethical shot means that you are practicing you're shooting, you're practicing your breathing, you're practicing your trigger pull, dry fire exercises, etc. Mm -hmm. People people don't think, think they just walk in the bush and, and go blam, blam, and the animal falls down. It's, it's not like that. There is a, a, a lot of element to practice and a lot of element to recognizing your quarry and understanding your quarry. And this is a really big thing that people don't talk about. I mean, how many times have we told people who hunted with us who want to take the shot? We ask them how much you've been practicing shooting, and when they say nil, we're like, yeah, you're not shooting. Oh, it's happened more than once, that's for sure. People get really mad about this, but I mean, I'm not going to sit there and, and let them potentially wound an animal when I know they're not going to make that shot. You don't, you want, you want, whatever, whenever you make a kill, you want that kill to be as, as for lack of a better term, as humane as possible. People get real mad about the humane term, but humane is, is a good term. It is a good term, and I mean, if you look at nature in general, Predators don't kill fast. I mean, look at a grizzly bear, for example. When he takes a prey, he basically just stands on it and starts ripping pieces of flesh off. Ideally, your shot has to be one and done. And I mean, if you want to argue what was humane and what's not, eh, I mean, just go watch videos of how your grocery store meat is made. And I mean, you might take a different take. Yeah, you want inhumane? Bulk farms are not humane. <laughs> 100%. However, they exist and they're currently a necessity. So... We can argue that, we could, we could argue that point, but we won't. I can tell you one thing though, an animal with a full life that dies like this because you, you practice your shooting. It's a, it's a clean and humane death. It is, absolutely. And uh, my first was like that as well. But yeah. I'm very thankful to have had that opportunity. I'll go into detail on that later. Though. Yeah, you know, let's, let's talk about your first. You want to? Yeah, oh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, it was, I believe, the third year we've been there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the third year, we're out, uh, we're out in the bush, we're driving by a clearing, and it's about mid to late afternoon, coming up on maybe 5, 5.30, and uh, we pull off to the side of the road, and I look off to the left, I'm in the driver's seat, as I usually am. Uh, that reason being for that is most of the time, he's a better shot than me, so he usually takes the first one. But for this particular instance, I was the one that spotted it, so it fell on my shoulders to continue the pursuit and take the animal. So, we watched this uh, bear for quite some time. It traversed down a hill and into a flat-ish clearing. There was a lots, of, uh, lots of obstacles, but it was relatively fat, flat, about maybe 250 yards to the clearing. So, what, what's funny is he, he thought I was going to do it. And he's like, he's, like, he's like, I'll get you the gun. And I'm like, well, no, no. It's, that was actually my first impression. And I'm like, no, no, it's, your, it's yours. Yeah, you saw it, you get to do the honors. Now, I knew Steve's shooting was on par. I mean, I've been work, shooting with him for a long time. His skills are there. And I mean, now it's just a fast of stalking and confidence. Mm -hmm. So I took uh, Marlin 4570, a lever action rifle with a dot sight on it. And I took the rangefinder and I started stalking. Uh, through the clearing. Uh, every so often I would stop and I would range find. 
And I kept doing this, kept watching the animal as it was uh, doing whatever it was doing around the clearing where the trees met the, uh, met the clearing. And I ended up making it to a very large stump. And I set up on the stump and I range find. It was about 106 yards. So I, I thought to myself, this is the best place I'm going to have. So I leaned into the stump. I sighted my rifle. I aimed for a broadside shot and I squeezed the trigger. The rifle went off. I saw the bear jolt. And at first glance, I thought, okay, I missed it. It's going to dash into the woods any time now. So I waited and I watched. And it took a few steps and it laid down. And then after a few seconds went by, it stood up, took a few more steps, and then laid down again. And at that point, I watched it for about a minute or so. And it didn't move at all. And I started thinking to myself, did I hit it? Did I not hit it? And I figured it would be pertinent to investigate. So I kept walking. And this is funny because this is where his, um, this is where his memory because the adrenal spike is not nearly as accurate as it probably should be. Because what he perceived is it, is it getting back up. I had been watching from with binoculars from about three, four hundred yards out. And um, I watched I watched the whole event take place. Put it through the lungs, bear jolted, took a few steps, and just went down. I knew exactly where it went down. I met up with him around the corner. Mm -hmm. He was looking for it. So I mean, frantically at this point, because I mean, he's adrenalized. And that was later in the day, so the sun was starting to go down. At the <laughs> so I'm like, it's probably right over here. <laughs> and, and sure enough, we actually found it laying in a bed of leaves. Yeah. Almost like, you know, you see uh, suckling pigs served on a platter and a bed of lettuce on a salad. And that's exactly the image that I have in my mind is this thing laying on its side in the bed of leaves. So we did the usual thing. We took a very long stick. We poked the bear in the eye. Didn't move. We waited a couple seconds. And that, when we concluded that it had passed, so uh, Lee at that point went back to the truck to get the sled. We had the sled that we used to take things out of here. And uh, I waited at the time. I still had the rifle with me. After a while, the sun started going down, and I got a little fed up, and I decided... Uh, I did swear to myself, and I went and I picked the thing up and basically <laughs> carried it a part of the way out of the bush. He's a little stubborn. And... Uh, I knew it was a double long shot at that point because as soon as I picked it up, I could feel the air coming out of the entry wound for the bear. And I knew at that point that it had been the absolute best shot I could have taken. It was, it was excellent. You clipped the heart and everything. It's exactly how he's supposed to do it. I mean, he doesn't really give himself a lot of credit for these things. But he's, he, he is remarkably ethical. He'll pass a shot before he'll take it. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, because as we go into the next part of this, as you're probably wondering after this story, what does this have to do with HEMA? Well, this has to do with the ability to take a life. I want you to consider this. It has to be a heavy thing you think about in your head when you practice the martial arts, especially weapon-based martial arts. Because let's face it, from a historical advantage, this was an art that was made to hurt, maim, and kill people. Yeah, unfortunately, that is the truth. The sword, the sword itself, um, really has limited hunting purpose. I mean, it's mostly a battlefield weapon. It really is. Battlefield or dueling weapon. Like a spear, hunting weapon. Bows, hunting, hunting weapons. Weapon. Knives? Well, come on. <laughs> knife is, knife, Hunting knife, tool. Knife is the original multi-tool. Exactly. There's like we can, the list goes on, right? Yes. But you start looking at the sword. It is it is purpose designed. Um, so when you start going into the hunt, it's the question of taking a life, right? Even an animal life, which most people should take some pause on when they do. Mm. Really, like it's about taking a life. Yeah. Anytime you go hunting, if you're just starting out, if you're just getting into it, one, you should go with somebody more experienced, and two, you should understand that by doing this, it involves taking another life. It does, and it's, there's no easy way of doing it. But he, the, here's a great question. Do you think, you're sitting there doing all your sword drills, and you're like, can you talk to your friends about Zompocalypse like everyone does at every HEMA event I've ever been to? Pretty much. Uh, anyone who says they haven't is bullshitting you. And uh, they're like, yeah, I could, I would totally waste, I would totally be able to fight off invaders of my keep or whatever the hell it is. But mm. you've never really taken a life, uh, especially big game, because there is a, almost a human quality when you have your animal up on the gambrel. Yeah, one of the things I've always believed is that every animal is somewhat unique. There are predetermined uh, characteristics or behavioral patterns based on the animal in question, but 
there are also differences. So I like to view every animal as unique. Just like a person. Yeah, exactly. You are taking the life of an individual. So you have to be prepared for that. And you can't really say that you can do that unless you have gone out and actually done it. Well, it's, it's like people, people talk, right? But you start looking into World War II, you start seeing um, rates of the better, the better marksmen, and they're all sustenance, farmers, people who hunted for, hunted like my grandparents hunted during the Great Depression, mm -hmm. right? You see these guys like hunting for their families, hunting game. Wasn't the uh, marksman who shot down the Red Baron a farmer? I believe so. Yeah. I'm not sure. I can't really, I'm not like 100% sure, but I believe so. Um, mo like most of my family on the pra growing up in the prairies of Saskatchewan, they were, they were farmers. Mm -hmm. Most of the yeah. best marksmen in any engagement that you've read in history, a lot of them were farmers. A lot of them were taught to shoot by their grandparents or their parents. I mean, it's bonus game. It's bonus meat for the table. Absolutely. And you know what? On lean years, if you didn't hunt, you didn't eat. My, gran my grandmother used to hunt grouse and small game with a slingshot. And she said the same thing. We watched her once nail a grouse from 30 yards with slingshot. Seemed pretty far. We didn't think she'd do it. Hit the grouse right in the head. And we asked her how she got so good at it. She goes, because when I missed, I got hungry. I went hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so Good motivation right there. But this is one of those things you've got to think of as a cycle of life. We see it in the modern in, in farming communities now. People who are like all over the world, people who are closer to their animals, have a lot more reverence for life itself, right? It sounds kind of counterintuitive because you're like, these people are killing animals for food. Mm. But when you, when you take time with the animals, you begin to appreciate them more. So that what, that way you understand the gravity of what it is to take a life. Exactly. Something you think about. And a lot of people view uh, hunting as just wholesale mass murder of animals in the wild. And it's really it's not. not. It's, it's really just, not. I'd say for every animal we take, I'd say we probably see 60 to 100 at or more. Least, at at least. least. And we, you, spend, we and I spend time watching them, taking pictures, I can't watching tell behaviors. You, yeah, I can't tell you how many times I mean, I've been driving up a Forestry Service Road and we see a herd of elk. Running across the river, running it's, up a hill, and every time it takes our breath away. It is. It's pretty it's amazing. Absolutely magnificent. They are magnificent creatures. That being that that being said, they're also magnificently tasty creatures. For anyone who has who has been there with us, and having elk at our house, um, like especially after Nicole took her first elk. I mean, seriously. How it long? Is, how, how long have you guys enjoyed that meat for? Um, two and a half years. Yeah. So I mean, it lasts a while. Yeah, a lot. Well, if you package it properly and get it done professionally, yes. So, which is what we did. Thanks, Nick Sakata, my good friend. Yeah. But um, honestly, it's when you think of the gravity of taking a life, this is part of a, a, a culture, a tradition that is almost gone from the people who live in the city, who are, who are essentially divorced from the food chain and divorced from the life cycle. Yeah. It's, a, it's a deeper philosophical question. Someone judges someone for taking a life as a hunter or as a sustenance farmer, and they and they do. They always judge them. Meat is murder, blah, blah, blah. And these are the same people that will go gladly go to a grocery store and buy a bulk farm steak from the meat department. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Drives me crazy. But they're divorced from reality in that yeah. sense. It separates you from nature, and you can't separate us from nature. We're part of this environment. This is, part of nature. this is so important, a concept to grasp, that we are a part of this, part of this, like, this greater sphere of life, mm -hmm. right? If you don't really, if you aren't in the environment, how can you respect it? Exactly. And there's a deepening respect that all hunters have for nature. That's where the concepts of conservation come in. If conservation isn't followed, there won't be any game to hunt. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't, strong, I can't say it strongly enough. It's not just an Elver, Elmer Fudd, everybody blasting away with their double barrel shotguns, like out of, a, out, of a, out of cartoons, right? It's just not like that. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason he was one of the dumbest characters in the show. That's true, right? But a good, a good person to look at, even better, way better than us, who is much better hunter than you and I will ever be, uh, the Stephen Rinello's Meat Eater series is, it gives a really strong uh, uh, understanding of what it means to hunt. And he's done a lot of different things on that show as well. It's not like he goes out all this time with this high-tech semi-automatic rifle. I believe there was one episode where he went out uh, with a single-shot rifle that took, what, a minute and a half to reload? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah was, I, think, I think that might have been the, um, the Black Powder episode. The Black Powder. Anyway. Um, so, I mean, he's done a lot of stuff on that show. It's a great show to take in. But and at the end of the day, at the end of Steve's bear hunt, what we see is Steve Steve sitting there with his whiskey, and he's not really drinking it. And he kind of he's getting kind of teary eyed a little bit. And I kind of walk up to him and say, "Well, what's, what's wrong, right?" 
I mean, I grew up in a bit of a hunting family, so it doesn't really bother me, but this is the first time. It was. And there is definitely an emotional response that comes with, especially it being your first time, because, and I did feel that. I did feel some semblance of guilt. I had just taken another living creature's existence away from them for my own sustenance. But soon that gets replaced with uh, gratitude. I was thankful that this creature had given its life so that I could sustain myself. I mean, you use as much as you can of the animal, right? So, you and then take the skeleton, you boil it for soup stock, you take all of the meat, you use every single bit. Of you meat. can. Nothing is wasted. You can. Like, you, like this. You, honestly, afterwards, you put the rest of the forest you can't use, and something else eats it. Yeah. Sustain, it sustains the rest of the forest. So, the coyotes need to eat as well. Uh, there's lots of creatures. But anyway, that kind of the idea of the cycle of life. And we see this, like, when, and a bit more on the cycle of life, like our friend Aaron, Aaron uh, Schober uh, had a pretty racy YouTube video that he took down. I think he took down or YouTube took it down, but it was him taking off a goat's head and it created a, created a bit of a stir. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't think it was so bad. I talked to him about it and he farms goats for sustenance for his own, for his own table. Yeah, and I've watched the entire video as well, and part of the things that he says in the, in the, the video is, is that he does, him and his wife decided to be farmers to farm their own meat because they wanted to be independent from the grocery store machine. They wanted to sustain themselves more naturally, just like people used to in the old times. And honestly, a free, uh, an animal living a life free range on property is living a much better life than an animal pen in a cage for slaughter at a particular date. Absolutely. So, and I mean, talking to him, he's a, I've known him for a while. He's a, a really nice guy, Aaron of uh, Sword Carolina. He was a super good guy. And I mean, he does this with great reverence, right? People judged him on it, but it's one of those things. Takes a goat's head off, people get a little upset about it. And it was is... pretty ballsy for a YouTube video, I'm oh, not going to lie. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it, beyond my, beyond both, my levels of ballsy on that. Both and I were really surprised they when we did. watched it. We were like, oh, okay. I mean, I'm not taken aback by the killing no. part. I'm just taken aback by the fact that he put on YouTube. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's, it, it's courageous, especially in yeah. the... Uh, with all the censorship that is going around. But the fact that neg the negative comments people he got from people and stuff like that, it showed me that there are a lot of people who are completely divorced from the life cycle. Mm -hmm. And this is something that hunting can give you that you might not expect. That and the ability to bond closer with people than you would expect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, Lee and I have been hunting now for what, it's, uh, six, seven years? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I wish I could say that it's getting easier. It's not. It's challenging every time. It is difficult every time. But it's adversity that makes us stronger. But then again, we're also more selective. We don't want to make sure we never lose an animal. Yeah, we want to make we sure know, we can recover it if we take it. We, we know more than we did before. We're also more selective with our game animals. We don't want small animals. We want like animals in their prime of their life that taste better. I mean, so waste not, want not, right? So, not there to take a life for no reason. So now let's talk about greater understanding of blade mechanics. And this is something you get from skinning, from processing an animal. Absolutely. Now, this is so funny because you always talk about people talk about their abilities of knife and they can't cut medium. If you can butcher your own animal, you understand intrinsically from your hand how a knife passes through, through skin, through flesh, through viscera, um, how it travels across bone. What happens to an organ if you accidentally penetrate it? What happens to the bladder when it gets penetrated and you're rushing it? Huh? That only happened once. <laughs> Believe me, <laughs> I might have been a bit pissed off. <laughs> oh, ha, uh, uh. ha. Steve, get, but <laughs> a whole different story. My point is, you start understanding the, not only how the blade travels, right, and how it how, 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 you, how it takes to cut through a tendon, the slicing mechanics, these things become natural to your hand after a while. It really is a significant learning experience when you're taking the skin off of a fresh kill and understanding how it operates and how it moves, because it's very different from anything you would expect. I've been teaching him knife for probably the past decade. And I mean, he's very good at knife, at knife, course, knife combat tournament and in free sparring. But there's still the, there was still the missing element of understanding how a blade moves through medium. And this is something that he gained hunting. Absolutely. I mean, when I got my first bear, um, we, I was skinning it well into the night. 
Uh, I refused to help him because it was an experience he had to do on his own first. And as much, it was very hard work. It was not easy. And my hand cramped up more than once, but it was necessary. It was necessary to have that experience because, again, you're going out into the woods. You're taking the life of a creature. You need to put in the work to fully appreciate the sacrifice that that creature is made. But you know what? I think you already have that appreciation. And more so for you is to come to the understanding of how the knife comes through medium. And understanding like the stickiness of the fat and all the different all the different things. Understanding where the organs are. These are things that a lot of people need to experience themselves. That's not for everyone. No. If you're squeamish, I mean, well, it's not going to be for you. Or it's a, or it's a challenge you can make. I'd rather look at it as a challenge. You could essentially challenge yourself to go over. It's true. It's an obstacle. It's a, a speed bump. It's a wall climb, just like any other. As I'm actually very thankful that uh, hunting with Lee is one of the ways I quickly found out that I was, in fact, not squeamish. Well, that being said, the majority of the processing that goes on at this house usually happens in Nicole. Now, people don't give her credit, but she is unbelievably fast with a knife. Her knife hand is like lightning. It travels across bone as though it, like bone is barely even there. And she doesn't accidentally stab herself in the hand like I do. I don't either. I'm not, but I'm pretty quick. I'm pretty quick too. I'm good at primal cuts and jointing, but man, she's quick on the on the major processing. So she'll have a primal. She'll have a deer broken down in an hour. Easy. It is something you get much faster at the more you do it. Exactly. But that being said, if a person knows how the blade travels through bone, Think of just consider it this way: that level of proprioception, that level of fuel in the sword. You're going to understand what your 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 hands are going to understand what you're doing for your brain does. I believe a couple about a year after my uh, my first kill, I ended up winning my gold medal in my first cutting tournament. Your cutting actually substantially approved, which is interesting. We had Amanda come over. We were processing that deer one time. Um, she was che checking it out. It's also a nice time to teach, her an teach anatomy. Mm -hmm. You have someone there. You have you have this animal strung up. You're able to teach a person that. You're able to show where the tendons move, in, move into different joints, where they connect through the muscle groups. It's a great opportunity to teach as well. It's something that people really look over in the hunting community, especially the, where the hunting and the martial arts blend. And the martial arts and the weapon arts are, I would actually even argue that maybe may more essential than people think. Probably right, considering how much my game went up afterwards. Yeah, and then your appreciation for knife work, and then your detail and focused on mm -hmm. focus in your knife work went up. Even your, actually, I would argue throughout all your all your cutting went up. And I've maintained it as well. It's not something that you can ignore. It needs to be maintained. Also, you want to start understanding anatomy and having a greater understanding of where the things are. Mm -hmm. You always think you know where something is. Until you open up, open something up, and you're looking inside, and then that really gives you that live that live experience. And people say, "Well, Lee, it's a little different than an animal. It's more similar than you think, especially like a black bear." Absolutely. Yeah. You have a black bear strung up and skinned up. It does, and without the head on it, looks it, a little human. <laughs> it has a very humanoid esque appearance. It does. I'm not gonna lie. People people do people say this, and you're always like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," and then you do it, and you're like, "Oh, hmm." Uh, a little more human than you would feel, most people feel comfortable with. It can be a little food. unnerving, but you have to understand that it just because it looks like a human doesn't mean it is. After the first few, I mean, yeah. you're, you're good with it. That makes it makes great steaks and ribs. So, Something and ground. Oh my god, yeah. But that, that's so yeah. That's a, that's what I want you to consider when you're going through it. How that affects your understanding of bleed mechanics through medium. And understand and your understanding of anatomy and physiology. These are important concepts for any martial artist, especially a weapons-based martial artist. Absolutely. Also, make sure you keep your knife sharpened. So, I mean, some of you are going to take the take away from this and be like, "Oh my God, these killers!" And some of you might take find this fairly in, interesting. Mm -hmm. Some of you actually may hunt yourselves. And people do take away from this what they want to. It's the nature of social media. But what I hope we've gotten across to you is the fact that there is some significance to human training involved. There is significance in lots of different and all martial arts life. training. All martial arts training, exactly. So, like, just consider that people who tell you if you can't take the life of an animal, and you're training in a life and death martial art, one that involves blades, weapons, etc. Uh, do you think you're going to be able to do what it counts? And I would argue, no. Do you think you're going to be able to understand the true nature of what you're training? I would, I would actually argue, looking, looking at the students we've taken with us, um, their ability to self-reflect after the hunt is 
leaps and bounds from what it was. It certainly it was certainly significant in my life. I have to say. And even so, an act of taking like a upland game bird, like a grouse, something small. I mean, it just changes a person's perception. Mm -hmm. So, like, for those who are totally opposed to it, I hope you can understand that there is an element of respect for the animal. And for those who are somewhat interested in it, I say go out and do it. Mm -hmm. I say go out and enjoy the nature. If you live in places that are fantastically beautiful, well, maybe hunting will be the second second part of your option, right? The second most important part of the trip. Exactly. And I mean, even if all you get out of these trips going hunting is a sincere enjoyment of the natural world, then I call that an accomplishment. It's uh, a it's win. Definitely an accomplishment. There's a lot of there's a lot of beautiful places in this world that you that you know, but you should probably see before you die. And I mean, we're still exploring our own backyard and it's still beautiful and breathtaking each time. It still amazes me. And that being said, take time to watch the animals. Mm -hmm. Take time to watch them. Watch how they move in their natural habitat. I mean, that'll also teach you things about yourself and about about like movement that you may not have considered. Mm -hmm. Watch how they move through the forest. Watch how they move through the, the trees, especially an animal as large as an elk. It, they are very graceful for their size. And the more animals you see, predator, predatory animals and prey animals, you'll see that they move differently. And that will, and that will, you'll start to see how we human beings evolved in our natural environment. Mm -hmm. And we'll st you'll start to understand our place in the role of the natural world. And perhaps you'll be less divorced from the food chain as well. Cheers to everyone out there. And cheers to all the hunters, because you understand.